Hey all Scott here. I am not doing well. It's been a week since daylight savings day. Worst holiday. I've changed my clocks. I'm still not used to it. I hate change. I've had the same feet for years, thank you. I don't want to change and I'm going to stick to doing what I do best. Playing games that released in 2018 on the PS3. The next generation of gaming is upon us. It's time to upgrade. No! No! Yeah, upgrading can be scary. I just consider myself a big fetus with hair. See, some people are perfectly content with what they already have. They don't need to constantly buy new toys to feel excitement. They can just keep playing with their mud and grass while I buy my fourth new iPhone this month. They may be physically responsible, but who's having the real fun here? But when a new video game console launches, there's always those few games that make anybody go, I want it. I want the brand new console with the new controller in this game and a compliment. Maybe not the compliment. Buying new game consoles the second they come out is always expensive. You don't really get the early adopter discount most of the time. You pay more to experience something first, but we live in an age where the second after a fancy new product is released, it's immediately outdated. If you wait around for it to get cheaper, the next new thing will come out to replace it. Then you'll wait for that to get cheaper and it happens all over again. We're in an endless loop of spending too much money. So yeah, I don't care about that fancy new console. I'll stick to my old one. It doesn't matter anyways, because all those new games coming out, yeah, they may be releasing for the new generation, but they're also releasing on the last one. Poverty wins again. These are cross-generation games. Games that release not only for the current generation consoles, but the last generation consoles as well. Xbox One games also releasing on Xbox 360. PlayStation 4 games also releasing on PlayStation 3 and two. But see, these downgraded versions can either be undeniably impressive or flat out terrifying. Sometimes they take a lot away from the big boy current gen versions since they have to create those games with the previous generation in mind. They can't go hog wild with the PS4 game because remember, they're making a PS3 game too. Though sometimes the last gen version is made first and then a current gen version is created based off of that build. I think this is the most resourceful way to go about it. But of course, most of the time they just take the current generation version and she's great the f out of it to fit on older consoles. Come on, video game industry, listen to me, white kid chair sits. So what defines a cross-generation game? Well, to me, I'm considering to be games that release on two or more generations of game consoles around the same time. It could be on the same day or within the first few months. This has been a standard for a while now. Back in the NES days, some games released between that and the SNES and Sega Genesis. But the NES version of a game was almost always completely different from the SNES version. Spot the difference. However, Nintendo themselves did a few cross-gen games, releasing on both systems. All puzzle games. Tetris 2, Yoshi's Cookie, Wario's Woods, these made their way to multiple consoles because NES users were worried they would have to buy a Super Nintendo just for Wario's Woods. Puzzle games aren't too graphically intensive and pretty simple overall, so putting them on the NES just made sense. Might as well support the system a couple seconds longer. It was usually the simplest games that made their way over to past consoles back then, like Frogger. The PS1 game came out and right alongside it were versions for the Genesis and SNES. These were 100% not the same games. But see, the cross-generation games I like are the ones where the platform lists as a nutritional facts label. It just keeps going and I just accept it. Games that appear on this many platforms are usually of the licensed kid game variety. One of the most notorious examples, Donald Duck going quackers. God, that Game. Eight platforms. Now, to be fair, some versions came out two years after the others, and two of these are handheld variants for the Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance. But just the fact this game swaps bit with nearly every console from one generation, and then the next one as well, is just straight up impressive. This has always been my standard. Normally for the first few years of a console, some games will come out for the previous generation as well, that's to be expected, but when the shift from the sixth generation to the seventh generation was happening, the game companies didn't know when to pump the brakes. The Rat Tad 2E video game. 11 different versions. Thank God, two people were scared they couldn't play. This game released on every major system from the sixth generation and every major system for the seventh generation. And really, they didn't have to. I think the original Xbox version was nearly canned, but GameStop nabbed it as a store exclusive. Well, now you gotta go. Licensed kids games in the mid to late 2000s were on as many platforms as it could possibly be on, and that's something we just don't see nearly as much nowadays. It's probably because back then the PlayStation 2 was still going strong. It was the most popular console of all time, and with the Nintendo Wii releasing to enormous success and having a similar power level, it just made sense to still produce versions of Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 games for this lower level of hardware. And at that point, you might as well puke out something for the GameCube. So many game consoles were a thing at the time, and nearly all of them had good reasons for developers to want to release on them. The Xbox 360, the most popular HD system at the time. The PlayStation 3, not as popular and harder to develop for, but there was still an install base, and it had comparable specs to the 360, so might as well put your game out on that. The Wii, now far less powerful than the 360 and PS3, but it had the biggest install base out of all of them. The PS2 was still selling and still had active users, and could run games made for the Wii pretty well, but why not make a last-gen version of the 
the title, there's still an active audience for that. And hey, the PlayStation Portable is sort of a portable PlayStation 2, it shouldn't be too hard to squirt that version on there. And at that point, I mean, might as well do a GameCube and Xbox version. A lot of users on these older consoles were kids. They can't immediately upgrade to the new systems whenever they want, so if you're making a kids game, making versions for these consoles it just made sense. PC and Mac versions too, why not? Oh, and Game Boy Advance and Nintendo DS games. They'll be completely different, but it makes the list funnier. It's all about making your game as accessible as possible. No matter what console somebody has, they should have the audacity to play your game. And one of the oddest examples of this initiative were the Burger King games on Xbox and Xbox 360. There was a promotion for a while where you could get these exclusive games at Burger King. They play on both Xbox and Xbox 360. You'd think that means, oh, these were just made for the original Xbox, and then the Xbox 360 could play the original Xbox games. The 360 can, in fact, play a good chunk of original Xbox games. No, there is a separate original Xbox version of these games and an Xbox 360 version on the same disc. It changes based on what you use it on, just like Benge. Cross-generation games were just different back then. There were so many different active consoles running all at the same time that it just made sense to put cars on everything. Except the PS3. The PS3 owners, just admit it. You f***ed up. But there was a game that changed cross-generation games forever. The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, released as a launch title for the Wii and one month later on the GameCube. See, Twilight Princess was initially revealed as just a GameCube game, but as time went on, its completion date lined up perfectly with the launch of Nintendo's next home console. Uh-oh! So why not prioritize a version for that console and have this big sweaty launch title alongside it? It was the same game across both consoles. I mean, the Wii was pretty much a GameCube on Adderall. It was more powerful, but is a rock really better than a big stone? Twilight Princess on Wii is in widescreen, which is nice. Though so much of the screen real estate is blocked by a giant Wii remote diagram, so it's sort of a half upgrade. You have forced motion controls in this version. Of course, it was the Wii and a launch title at that. They wanted to show off how the Wii remote could be a sword. They could have let you plug in a GameCube controller to control it just like the GameCube version, but of course, they wanted Wii users to be Wii users. Now, you'd think with the GameCube and Wii being so similar power-wise that these would be pretty identical versions outside of controls and the aspect ratio. Well, consider that most of the population is right-handed. Link has prominently been left-handed in Zelda games up to this point. Swinging the Wii remote with your right hand when Link attacks with his left would feel funny. So they decided to make Link right-handed in the Wii version. That was obviously done by just changing Link's model, right? Ah. It says no. The Wii version of Twilight Princess is mirrored. The entire game is flipped compared to the GameCube version. I mean, when the Wii version of this game was announced, did anybody say, yeah, I hope it's flipped? In all honesty, it's kind of cool they did that. It gives each version distinction while not necessarily taking away from either one. Cross-gen releases were always frequent, but Twilight Princess was one of the first big AAA titles to do so. A game you'd legitimately buy a new console for, releasing on an old one around the same time. This became a huge trend starting with the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. So many games released on those consoles in addition to the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. Though the difference was, there was quite a big leap in terms of power. Can PS4 games run on the PS3? Sure. Destiny. Far Cry 4. Dragon Age Inquisition. Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor. Assassin's Creed 4. Thief. Call of Duty Ghost. Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zero. Battlefield 4. Need for Speed Rivals. Murdered Soul Suspect. Alien Isolation. The Evil Within. Dragon Ball Xenoverse. Resident Evil Revelations 2. Battlefield Hardline. Call of Duty Advanced Warfare. All released on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. To be honest, many of these games worked on these platforms. Here I have Wolfenstein The New Order for Xbox 360, coming on a whopping four discs. One of them we pop in just to install the game onto the hard drive. That's how you can tell if the game really wasn't made for the 360, when you have to install it. This is normal, this is normal, this is normal. Playing the game, I mean, it works, everything's all here, though when it switches from the super high quality cutscenes to the actual gameplay, it's so much more noticeable than on PS4. It doesn't look too bad, but it obviously doesn't look the greatest either, but if you only had an Xbox 360 or PlayStation 3 and wanted to play this game, it's not a bad option. I, I did get stuck on nothing here though, and then my bullets were suspended in the air. I, I, I could shoot them though, so false alarm. Metal Gear Solid 5 The Phantom Pain was such an odd game to be cross-gen. It released in late 2015, and being such a huge graphical showcase, you'd think they'd want to keep it on PS4 and Xbox One, but nope, 360 and PS3 versions with a mandatory install, thank you very much. This was probably released on last-gen platforms due to the first part of the MGS5 experience releasing on them as well, Ground Zeroes. At least that released in early 2014, only a few months into the new console's lives, so it felt 
felt more warranted. Jesus, you can tell this was not made for these consoles. Just how pixelated everything can be. It still looks all right. So you can tell this game is not the most comfortable in this environment. And there's Watch Dogs. Oh, Watch Dogs. A game initially revealed as the showcase title for the next generation. A game that couldn't be done on the current platforms. An experience you'd have to buy a PlayStation 4 or Xbox One for but it also runs on soap. Two discs and one installation later, bam, it's Watch Dogs as God intended. <laughs> Mediocre. Most of these 360 versions run fine enough. I mean, they're not as good as the next-gen alternatives, but if you really wanted to play these games and this was your only option, definitely serviceable. It's just odd seeing some games go the cross-gen route, like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5. Could a game like this run on the 360? No, oh, no problem. Look at these clouds. Titanfall was a game that actually got people interested in the Xbox One initially. And it also came to the Xbox 360 a month later. Well, that deflates a lot of excitement. Even when the game is coming to Xbox One, just knowing a 360 version existed, well, nice for 360 users, it kind of made you think, like, is this game going to be a compromised experience on Xbox One because they had to consider the fact it was coming to 360 as well? The crew came to PS4, Xbox One, and Xbox 360. Not the PS3, I just thought that was kind of funny. Call of Duty Black Ops 3 made its way to the last generation consoles. Multiplayer only. These things are a stand-up routine. Laugh. Persona 5 released on the PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4 in 2017, which is insane. I mean, many times games release on older platforms like that due to kept promises. This was an era of long development and crowdfunding, so when game projects were proposed and took years to actually come out, and a 360 version was promised when the 360 was actually alive, so developers promised a 360 version of Mighty Number no. 9, you bet your ass they kept that promise, they made Mighty Number no. 9. Though as time went on, many games that were planned to appear on previous generations just end up not working out, either they figured the amount of effort it would take to port their game over wouldn't be worth it based on the current install bases. The game was just too intense to run well, or they just didn't feel like it anymore. Mortal Kombat X, Mad Max, Dying Light, Shantae, Half Genie Hero, last gen versions were planned, but ended up being canceled. But Little Big Planet 3 released on PS3. Why? It's not like Sony was doing a ton of PS3 games releasing right alongside PS4 versions. Like, there were so many PS3 games released the year of the PS4. They could have put Gran Turismo 6 on the PS4, Ratchet and Clank into the Nexus, Puppeteer, Sly Thieves in Time, God of War Ascension. No! Little Big Planet 3! That's the only one that needs to be on both. Hey, they did us a favor. The PS3 wouldn't be the PS3 without Little Big Planet 3 in 2014. So these are all sort of neat. They exist. It's kind of fun. They all run and look worse than their next-gen counterparts. No f***ing way. But it's sort of cool to see these games I know of as PS4 titles running on hardware released in 2005. But sometimes, developers go a different route and decide to make exclusive versions of games to run on old systems. I believe this is referred to as stupid. These are... It's sort of cross-gen. I mean, they are and they aren't. Exclusive versions of games for the previous generation. Interesting tactic. And I think Ubisoft takes the cake here for most effort put into a dog shit idea. It's 2014, and Assassin's Creed Unity is releasing for PS4, Xbox One, and PC, and PS4, Xbox One, and PC only. I gotta say, I'm pretty surprised Ubisoft was that quick to make Assassin's Creed a current-gen only game. Uh, the last entry, Black Flag, was on everything because it was a launch title for the new consoles, and the next year, BAM! only for the new consoles. But that was because they created an exclusive Assassin's Creed game for the previous gen, Assassin's Creed Rogue, released on the same day as Unity. These are two separate games, you need two separate generations of hardware to experience. They did this as an experiment. It was hard for publishers to give up support on this generation because it lasted a lifetime and these systems had huge install bases. They were worried that loads of players were still on 360 and PS3 and would either miss out on the latest Assassin's Creed or wouldn't buy a watered down port. How about an exclusive one just for them, see if there's a reason to keep both of these platforms around. I don't know, this was well into the Assassin's Creed fatigue. People were already getting tired of a new game every year, so what does Ubisoft do? Release two Assassin's Creeds on the same day. God, I'm so fucking sick of peanut butter, I wish I had two jars instead of one. I just view this as a waste of development. The team that made this could have made anything but Assassin's Creed for either current or previous gen systems, but no. They had to make another game and a series milk dry on consoles nobody cared about anymore. A similar situation happened with Call of Duty when World at War released for Xbox 360, PS3, and Wii, a separate version released on the PlayStation 2, World at War Final Fronts. A completely separate game. I still don't understand the point of this. Obviously, World at War would have worked on the PS2. It worked on the Wii, so what was the big deal? This was probably them testing the waters, just like with Assassin's Creed Rogue, see if the PS2 audience still cared about new exclusive games in 2008. 
But still, at that point, why not put Final Fronts on the Wii as well, or port it to the PSP? They put all this development time into a version that just released on the PlayStation 2. Sonic Unleashed on the Wii and PS2 released alongside the 360 and PS3 versions, they are completely different games. They follow roughly the same plot and structure, but the levels are all different, so it's like, is this a cross-gen game or just straight up different entities? Sonic the Hedgehog released on the Sega Master System and Sega Genesis. What is this? Again, two completely different games. Is this cross-gen? One of my favorite weird examples is Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. Much like the mainline Pokemon games, the first game was released as two separate versions, Blue Rescue Team and Red Rescue Team. Both on different consoles on the same day. Blue was on the Nintendo DS, Red was on the Game Boy Advance. How many people went, I can f and I can also f with that? I think that's confusing if anything. Cross-gen games became more and more common as the years went on. They were mostly reserved for the kids' games, but lately, look at this. So many games releasing on the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5, Xbox One, and the fourth generation of Xbox consoles. It's becoming commonplace for big AAA games to release across generations like this. One of the greatest games of the generation is debatable whether it's a part of this generation or not, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. This was almost an exact repeat of the Twilight Princess situation. The game was announced for Wii U, got delayed so many times, its completion date lined up with the Nintendo Switch's release. Oh, oh god, they didn't mean to! It made for one a hell of a launch title and swan song for the Wii U. I mean, the reason for this game being cross-gen wasn't necessarily to give it the biggest install base possible, rather, it was out of obligation. They announced they were working on Zelda for Wii U all the way back in 2013. People bought Wii U's just for this game. They had to release it for the system. And? It works. There's really not any cool differences between versions like there was with Twilight Princess on the GameCube and Wii. It's sorta neat to see the Wii U gamepad show up in the menus instead of Switch controllers. You can play the game directly on the gamepad, though the original plan was to have the map always down there. That would've been a cool feature exclusive to the Wii U version, but that was scrapped. Both releases look nearly identical. From my experience, the Switch version seems to look and run a bit better, but they're pretty much the same. It's probably a lot of shiny new device bias. Of course the Switch version looks better. Don't tell me I wasted $300. Well, technically in some ways, the Wii U version actually loads faster. Again, not by much though. But when we hit the home button and then go back to the game, it needs to reload on Wii U. We also have to install a ton of data. So while the Wii U may have been the original platform for the game, it was definitely pretty optimized for the Switch. Yeah, it's a lot of work to put your game on multiple platforms. I should know. I've played Bubble Bobble. I know everything about video games, but that doesn't stop some franchises from going on every platform conceivable. For example, the Lego games. You can always count on these being something you call an exterminator for. Just Dance. Yep, multiple entries released on the Nintendo Switch, the Wii U, and the Wii all at the same time, in addition to Xbox 360 and PS3 releases. And then Just Dance 2020 released on just the current platforms and the Wii. To be fair, it made sense not to make a Wii U version. I mean, you can play the Wii game through the Wii U. It's not like you'd be missing out that year. And of course, we can't forget Where's the Wii U version? The sports games. FIFA 2005 ended up being released on the PlayStation 1 in 2004. FIFA 19 released for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 in 2018, but this one was the Legacy Edition, which many EA didn't care, and this is just FIFA 17 or something with an updated player roster. But then FIFA 14 in 2013 released for the PS2. Same Legacy Edition tactic of an older FIFA game re-released, but this game came out for the PS3 and PS4, as well as the PSP and PS Vita. The Wii? Not the Wii U, though. This is ridiculous. But look at how many versions existed. That's almost as crazy as... No? No, this is pretty sane. Sports games have sort of settled down in terms of platform supported. Madden barely goes outside of the PlayStation and Xbox consoles anymore and jumped out of the previous generation decently quickly. Persona 5 came out for the PS3 more recently than Madden did. The Madden of the new generation. Cross-generation games are undoubtedly good for the consumer, not forcing everybody to spend hundreds of dollars on a new system to play a game that can technically work perfectly fine on the console they already have. But I'd be lying if I said their existence didn't make things less exciting when a new generation comes along. Why should I care? I can play this game on a f***ing tree trunk. What's there to be excited about? I think it just goes to show that the games are truly what matters here. Uh, you shouldn't buy a new console just because it's the new console. You should buy it because there are meaningful experiences to have on there. If the games on that platform are already available on the platform you already have, you don't need the new console. But Sackboy has a 5 on the box now. I said don't buy the console, you can buy the games.